Welcome to this uh, ISN Kediga webinar on Hepatitis C guideline update. Uh, I'm the moderator, Annette Bruckfeld, and the speakers today will be Paul Martin and Michel Jadoul. So the uh, guidelines uh, were updated from the last ones published in 2018, and you can find this uh, updated guideline on open access on both Kedigo and Kidney International websites. And this is a second reminder, the executive summary, uh, which is a shorter version. So this is the work group membership. So two of the speakers are here today, and I'm also the moderator. And this is the evidence review theme that team that works on those guidelines with us. So uh, I'll start with introducing uh, Paul Martin, who uh, was the work group co-chair and is a professor of medicine uh, and chief of division of digestive health and liver disease at the University of Miami <clears throat> in the USA. And he also serves on the board of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases as the counselor at large and has a long-standing interest in viral hepatitis and organ transplantation. So okay. please, Paul. Thank you very much, Annette. It's uh, early afternoon in Miami. I know we're um, talking to an international audience, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are. As you've heard, we're doing an important update on the management of hepatitis C in uh, chronic uh, kidney disease. And I'm going to focus on areas which include advances in antiviral therapy and also the management of hepatitis C in kidney transplant patients. Next slide, please. Here are my disclosures, which are pertinent to this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So this is extracted from the uh, guidelines. And, uh, this is uh, chapter two of the uh, five chapter guidelines. All patients with chronic kidney disease of all stages, including on dialysis and kidney transplant recipients with hepatitis C should be evaluated for direct acting antiviral based uh, therapy. DAA therapy is highly effective and well tolerated in all stages of chronic kidney disease, including in dialysis patients and renal transplant recipients. And very importantly, we no longer endorse the use of interferon or ribavirin-based uh, regimens to treat hepatitis C in this or indeed in any population. Next slide. This is a nice uh, figure illustrating the various targets for antiviral therapy uh, directed against uh, hepatitis C. And we deal with a number of uh, major compound classes, which are shown in this slide. These include uh, inhibitors of uh, replication, the NS5A region of the hepatitis C viral genome, polymerase inhibitors, and also protease inhibitors. And in each of these uh, categories, there are several compounds which have been developed and are licensed in various parts of the world. Next slide. To increase the efficacy and to uh, prevent development of resistance, typically these regimens include two or more of compounds drawn from the different um, uh, drug classes. And again, uh, they're illustrated here in this uh, figure. Next slide, please. Now, one of the issues had been whether direct anti acting antiviral therapy could impact um, renal function patients with chronic uh, kidney disease. And the concerns included um, uh, side effects as well as a direct effect on the uh, renal uh, function. This is a report from actually one of our uh, writing group uh, Dr. Cisse, a retrospective study in over 1,000 chronic kidney disease patients treated with DAAs. Uh, treatment slowed the decline of the estimated GFR if it had been less than 60 mLs at baseline, and in non-diabetic patients, a reduced albuminuria. So in other words, uh, in this very large experience using a variety of different regimens, there was no evidence that treatment um, accelerated uh, the decline in um, 
renal function patients with chronic kidney disease and indeed appeared to slow it. Next slide, please. From the uh, same paper, uh, this shows the effect of uh, antiviral therapy before and after in terms of the uh, GFR. And in patients without diabetes mellitus, it uh, appeared to improve or increase the estimated GFR. Next slide. And in a similar fashion, um, antiviral therapy reduced albuminuria in uh, patients with chronic kidney disease who did not have underlying uh, diabetes mellitus as a factor in their kidney disease. So this is large and reassuring data that these various regimens are safe and are beneficial not only in terms of liver disease, but also in renal function in patients with chronic kidney disease. Next slide, please. A particular issue had been the um, role of sofosfavir, which is a keystone drug in many of the uh, drug regimens, but whether it was safe in patients with chronic uh, kidney disease. This is a large study published earlier this year uh, from Taiwan in which they had nearly 13,000 patients with chronic kidney disease who'd been treated for hepatitis C with various DAA regimens, including sofosfavir based regimens in about 50% of uh, patients. And again, reassuringly, what this study showed was the estimated GFR increased progressively in treated patients with a baseline GFR less than 30 ml, irrespective of uh, regimen. And this benefit was also irrespective of the, uh, whether the patient had had uh, exposure. I interestingly, in this study, patients with um, better preserved GFRs appeared to derive less uh, uh, benefit because there are clearly other cofactors in progression of their kidney disease. But this and similar reports have led to um, the widespread adoption of sofosfavir based uh, therapy in the management of patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. Next slide, please. So when we go to select an individual uh, regimen, the choice should be based on treatment history, the potential for drug drug interactions, the GFR, liver fibrosis stage, transplant candidacy, and uh, comorbidities. But we're less concerned about uh, the uh, GFR now with a, a widening experience with the use of the differing regimens. Very importantly, if a pan-genotypic regimen is not available, hepatitis C genotype and subtype should uh, guide uh, therapy. Next slide, please. These are the major pan-genotypic uh, regimens with high resistance barrier available and licensed to treat chronic hepatitis C infection. On the left, there are sofosfavir-based uh, regimens. The cladosphere is licensed in some parts of the world and is an option for use uh, in combination with sofosfavir. On the right-hand side, the so-called GP regimen also is pan-genotypic with a high resistance uh, barrier. Now, there is a lot of information about these uh, various uh, uh, studies, and I would direct you not only to the KDGO guideline, but the other guidelines developed by the specialty societies, including the ASLD uh, with the hepatitis C guidelines, EASL, the European Society, and APASL, the uh, Asian Pacific Society. Next slide, please. This uh, figure from the KDECO document is a list of the various uh, regimens that are licensed in various parts of the world to treat chronic hepatitis C. And on, on the left-hand side, uh, what we've listed are the different uh, populations with chronic uh, kidney disease, including all the way down the bottom uh, patients who are on dialysis or have had a uh, renal uh, transplant. So as you can imagine, there's, again, a lot of data on this slide, and I would encourage you to go to our guideline and one of the other guidelines I've mentioned when you come to treat uh, individual patients. As you can see, there are some limitations uh, for uh, one of a uh, few of the regimens there, which are efficacious only against uh, genotypes one and uh, four. Next slide, please. 
Now, very importantly, um, hepatitis C uh, therapy is now available and easy to use in kidney transplant recipients. And it, it, one of the important issues is to work with the transplant center to optimize the timing of um, uh, therapy. And as I'll discuss shortly, uh, we're now endorsing the use of hepatitis C positive uh, donors. So it may be appropriate to defer antiviral therapy until after the uh, transplant so the recipient can receive a, an organ from an infected uh, donor. Irrespective of the timing of uh, therapy, there are some important aspects to treating uh, patients who are on immunosuppression, immunosuppressant regimens and uh, a variety of other uh, medications. And one of the things to be aware of is potential drug-drug interactions, particularly on patients who are on immunosuppressive medications. Next slide, please. So uh, a number of aspects to this. It's important to monitor calcineurin levels during and after DAA therapy. There's some direct drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Uh, but secondly, with improvement of hepatic function, following successful hepatitis C treatment, metabolism of some of the um, immunosuppressive drugs, such as uh, Prograf, may become more efficient and the uh, levels uh, drop, potentially setting the stage for a rejection episode. Again, I would emphasize there are a variety of other potential drug-drug interactions, including um, between some of the uh, antiviral agents um, and the um, calcineurin uh, levels uh, during treatment, and also uh, the levels of some of the hepatitis C drugs can also be raised by concomitant um, calcineurin use. Now, again, a lot of complicated information, but I want to direct your attention to this website developed by the University of uh, Liverpool, which lists the key interactions between immunosuppressive drugs and um, hepatitis C-based uh, uh, DAA uh, regimen. So again, I think the important issue is to be aware of the potential for drug-drug interactions and to um, do a little research before starting treatment in an individual patient. Next slide, please. Another issue that has come up over the last uh, few years is the potential of successful treatment of hepatitis C to cause reactivation of hepatitis B. Hepatitis C and hepatitis B have sort of a reciprocal relationship with each other, and hepatitis C appears to have a, a suppressant effect on hepatitis B uh, activity. So all patients, not just chronic kidney disease patients, being uh, considered for hepatitis C treatment should have hepatitis B markers checked. If the hepatitis B surface antigen is present, the patient should undergo assessment for uh, therapy to prevent hepatitis uh, B reactivation during hepatitis C treatment. And very importantly, also if the surface antigen is absent, but markers of prior infection, most notably hepatitis B core antibody with or without surface antibody are present, uh, there is the potential for reactivation during uh, therapy with um, the DAAs for hepatitis C. Next slide. Now, uh, this is a, a, a report from a few years ago, which summarized um, the literature about the risk of hepatitis B reactivation with DAA therapy for hepatitis C. So they identified over 1,600 patients who had evidence of current or prior hepatitis B infection. And very importantly, reactivation occurred in almost a quarter of the chronic hepatitis B patients. So these were the surface antigen positive patients um, with uh, hepatitis C uh, treatment. And the risk was highest if they also had HPV DNA detectable uh, pre-therapy. Uh, the risk of reactivation was substantially lower in patients with evidence of re remote resolved hepatitis B. These are the core antibody positive patients. And 
finally, severe reactivation was only recognized in patients who were surface antigen positive uh, pre-hepatitis C therapy. So this is a real phenomenon. And um, again, it's important to anticipate a reactivation in surface antigen positive patients. Next slide, please. So in the gui our guideline, we mentioned the indications for hepatitis B therapy. These are the conventional uh, indications uh, listed here. In a surface antigen positive patient, treatment is recommended if the HVV DNA is greater than 2,000 international units and the ALT is greater than the upper limit of uh, normal. Now, the guidelines, the hepatitis B guidelines have evolved also, and there's an increasing interest in treating any patient with hepatitis B who uh, has evidence of uh, replication. What we suggest in the guideline is monitoring uh, patients if they don't meet the criteria for treatment, but they're surface antigen positive. But what I would like to propose is with the difficulty following up in patients and so on, it's probably prudent if a patient is surface antigen positive pre-hepatitis C treatment to start treatment for hepatitis B also. Otherwise, uh, particularly in the core positive patients, monitor for a rise in ALT during and after um, hepatitis C treatment and check the HPV DNA if there's a rise in the ALT level. Next slide, please. I next want to move on to the management of kidney transplant uh, candidates and recipients uh, with hepatitis C. Right. Uh, we endorse kidney transplantation as the best option for patients with chronic kidney disease, irrespective of hepatitis C genotype, or indeed the presence of hepatitis C. We suggest that all kidney transplant patients with hepatitis C be evaluated for severity of liver disease and presence of portal hypertension prior to acceptance for kidney transplantation. So we want to exclude patients with more advanced liver disease who uh, potentially will uh, develop hepatic decompensation. Next slide, please. This is a representation of the natural history of the progression of portal hypertension. And an important concept in here is the difference between compensated uh, liver disease and decompensated liver disease. And we can predict this by measuring the portal pressures. Now, this is a somewhat invasive uh, procedure, and certainly in uh, North America, it's performed by radiologists elsewhere in the world. For instance, uh, Europe, I know often hepatologists perform these uh, measurements. But very importantly, if the uh, portal pressure is less than 10 millimeters of mercury, the patient has an excellent long-term prognosis in, from the point of view of their liver disease, and they are unlikely to have complications such as varices. Once the portal pressure increases above 12 millimeters of mercury, patients start to run into problems, the development of varices, onset of ascites, et cetera, et cetera. And as the portal pressure increases further over the natural history of cirrhosis, the patient develops a more floridly decompensated liver disease. Next slide. So we have incorporated this information into the guidelines and our recommendation wa uh, was that patients with compensated cirrhosis without portal hypertension undergo isolated kidney transplant. So in other words, even though they're cirrhotic, they don't meet any conventional need for a liver transplant. In that circumstance, we were comfortable recommending the patient have an isolated kidney transplant. If patients have more clinically overt liver disease, with, um, with complications such as varices or ascites, or the portal pressure is already greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, our recommendation was that the patient undergo a combined liver kidney uh, transplant. Next slide, please. The next issue I wanna talk about is the uh, treatment of hepatitis C in kidney transplant. Um, uh, recipients. And um, as I mentioned earlier, this should be done in collaboration with the center where the patient is going to receive their um, uh, transplant. Uh, we also suggest that hepatitis C infected um, 
kidney uh, transplant candidates with a living donor be treated before or after transplant, depending on the time of um, uh, transplant potentially. By uh, treating pre-kidney uh, uh, transplant, we will provide further protection for the graft. But on the other hand, that does delay the procedure for at least a few months while the patient is getting uh, treated. Next slide, please. We also recommend that all kidney donors uh, be screened for hepatitis C with both immuno, immunoassay and nuclear acid testing. Uh, we also suggested that uh, hepatitis C infected living kidney transplant donors without fibrosis should be treated before donation. So in this part of the guideline, we endorsed the use of uh, kidneys from hepatitis C infected uh, donors who did not have advanced liver disease. Next slide. Now, another important development has been the use of organs from hepatitis C infected uh, donors for hepatitis C uninfected uh, recipients. And we just advanced the slide a little bit. And two important uh, studies uh, were published, uh, which opened up this uh, possibility. Just keep on advancing the slide there uh, and a little more. And both of these studies illustrated that it was feasible to use organs from hepatitis C infected donors for hepatitis C uninfected uh, recipients. Next slide, please. And patients were typically uh, treated uh, shortly after receiving their new kidney. Next slide, please. We also recommended that kidneys uh, from hepatitis C infected donors be considered regardless of the hepatitis C status of the recipient in the past. These had been reserved for recipients who already had hepatitis C. Obviously, there's a need for informed uh, consent, and the centers must confirm availability of antiviral therapy for hepatitis C to be administered uh, shortly after the kidney transplant. Next slide, please. Now, from our guideline, this uh, slide illustrates the algorithm for managing hepatitis C infected uh, candidates for a, a kidney uh, transplant. And in essence, what we determine is the severity of the uh, liver disease if there are candidates for an isolated um, renal transplant, we then uh, suggest different part of the algorithm according to whether they have a living donor or a, a deceased donor. And uh, treatment uh, timing is tailored to the expected uh, time of uh, transplant and whether or not if the patient is receiving a deceased donor, whether it's likely that they will um, get a hepatitis C infected uh, donor. Next slide, please. We also suggested that uh, patients be tested for hepatitis C three months after transplant of hepatitis C treatment was administered prior to transplant or if they develop hepatic uh, dysfunction. Now, I would add that these treatment regimens are highly effective. There's a very low risk or not probably a, a minuscule risk of a relapse of hepatitis C following um, successful uh, therapy. Very importantly, following the kidney transplant is important. Um, cirrhotic patients continue to have regular follow-up for uh, their cirrhosis, including anticipating complications such as hepatocellular carcinoma. And then finally, hepatitis C infected kidney transplant recipients should be tested for proteinuria every six months. But again, we would anticipate that these will all be treated and there's unlikely to be an effect, effect of hepatitis C on the uh, new kidney. Next slide, please. And this is my final figure showing the uh, excellent uh, five-year allograft survival for recipients of kidney transplant recipients from hepatitis C infected versus uninfected disease donors in the direct acting antiviral era. So in other words, we can now offer uh, potential recipients um, renal transplant 
uh, without worrying about the consequences of hepatitis C infection in their uh, graft survival or their, um, also their personal survival. So I'm going to uh, stop now and I'll hand it back to Annette, I think. Yes. Thank you very much, Paul, for this uh, excellent summary of the main points in chapter two and four of the updated guidelines. And of course, we can see here that the treatment field has moved very quickly since the last guideline for CKD and kidney transplant patients. So just as a reminder that chapter one and three um, uh, have uh, remained uh, as the current one and have not been changed. Uh, I also want to uh, ask people uh, if they have any, we have received a few questions, but please add more questions in the Q&A box and we will, uh, the speakers will answer those at the end. So now I want to move on to our next speaker, Professor Michel Jadoul, who's uh, chair in the Department of Nephrology at the Clinique Universitaire Saint-Luc and is full clinical professor of medicine at uh, the uh, Université Catholique at Louvain. Louvain. And uh, he's uh, been um, doing research in hepatitis C, complications after in hemodialysis patients and in kidney transplantation. And uh, he's a co-chair of uh, Kedigo and has uh, also, is also a theme editor of nephrology dialysis transplantation. So please, uh, Michel, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Annette. It's a pleasure to be here during this webinar. Here are my disclosures. You said the main one being that I'm since now some years co-chair of Kedigo. Now, my presentation, as expected, because I will only cover, as you said, chapter five, which is about the hep C related glomerulonephritis. So, my presentation will be short, shorter than that of Paul, which is uh, agreed, and we'll leave time for discussion. So, the, the, the key point in chapter five, I would say, is that the work group felt that after more and more experience with hep C related glomerulonephritis, it was time to consider or discuss the possibility of not performing a biopsy, a kidney biopsy in some of those cases. And this is, uh, this is illustrated in that algorithm. If you follow me from the top, you have so a patient with hep C and a severe glomerulonephritis, like for instance, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or nephrotic syndrome. Now the first point as mentioned by Paul for all CKD stages, and that includes those with early or later CKD and glomerulonephritis, the first point is that all, basically each of these patients should be treated with a DAA regimen. I will not discuss that, but that's, let's say, the backbone, first part. And that if, if that is the case, and he has severe RPGN or nephrotic syndrome, we are on the left-hand side, and then of course, you want to know the extent of the hyperacute, the crescents possibly, and the extent of hyperacute or acute kidney lesion. So a kidney biopsy is probably still uh, very important and to consider in addition to DAA immunosuppression. But on the right hand side, in those with let's say mild to moderate glomerulonephrite that is most likely relate to the hep C positivity, of course, viremia usually. Then the work group uh, considered that there are a number of typical features of that kind of hep C uh, induced or hep C related glomerulonephritis. And these typical features include the hematuria, uh, a low C4 level in serum, the presence of circulating cryoglobulins, even more so if there are systemic signs of cryoglobulinemia and the presence of a rheumatoid factor. Now you will notice there are five features. Now, if you have all five, this is considered really as a very typical presentation of hep C related GN. On the other hand, if you had none of them, it's very atypical. Of course, there may be cases in between that are more or less, but not very atypical or not very typical. The more the presentation is typical, if the GFR and proteinuria status under DAA is stable and you start up from DAA and you see what happens, well, those patients may, if I may say so, may escape the kidney biopsy because the kidney biopsy wouldn't change the management. 
they most likely never will require immunosuppression. On the other hand, if they have a typical presentation, but the proteinuria or the GFR worsens progressively over time, it may still be time to perform a kidney biopsy, of course, not a year later, but some months later. And on the right hand side, if the presentation is atypical or there is worsening, of course, then you doubt about the diagnosis. You are not sure if the glomerulonephritis signs are related to the hep C or there is worsening. It may be wise to uh, perform a biopsy and depending on the results of the biopsy, consider immunosuppression. So the, the key message here is that most patients still would benefit from a kidney biopsy, but still quite a number may escape the biopsy. And as we all know, at least as nephrologists, a kidney biopsy is not uh, without a risk. So if we can avoid that in some patients, that's a benefit. Next slide, please. I've summarized on the next slide the few uh, guideline statements of the, about the hep C-related glomerulonephritis. The first one summarizes what I said. Hep C infected with a typical presentation of immune complex proliferative GN can be managed without a confirmatory kidney biopsy. However, a biopsy may indicate in certain clinical circumstances uh, severity, initial or worsening or a doubtful diagnosis. Second, we recommend that patient with hep C associated GN receive antiviral therapy. As you can see, that's a 1A level recommendation. So really, that's very important. Patients with hep C associated GN, a stable kidney function without nephrotic syndrome, well, they can be treated as shown in the algorithm with DAA prior to other treatments. But still, if they have very clinically severe disease like a cryoglobulinemic flare or ARPGN, well, they can be treated with both DA and immunosuppressive agent with or without plasma exchange that is discussed in the text. And the decision whether to use immunosuppressive agents in patients with nephrotic syndrome should be individualized. RPGN or severe life-threatening cryoglobulinemic flare, nobody would hesitate. On the other hand, nephrotic syndrome, case-by-case -case discussion. And in patients needing immunosuppressive therapy because they have histologically active hep C associated GN who do not respond initially to the DAA, uh, well, those will most likely uh, need uh, immunosuppressive agent. That's the recommendation of the work group. And that didn't change since, uh, since the 2018 hep C update, but I want to highlight again that in that respect, really rituximab is considered that may be a little, a bit excessive, what I will say, but really, in my experience and that of the world group members, as a wonder drug. So it's the first line immunosuppressive treatment, which does not mean that corticosteroids, if there are crescents, may not have a place for a short course of a month or two. I will show in the next slide, please. Uh, the results of one of the two randomized control trials, but really the experience of the experts in the world group is perfectly in line with that RCT, there has been a second one. This is the US-based one from NIH, showing clearly in the rituximab group on the right hand side that after some months only of rituximab, there is a, a dramatic reduction of the BVAS score, which is a score of activity of the vasculitis uh, uh, related to the cryoglobulinemia, whereas the control group, there is no change at all. There has been a second in the same issue of arthritis and rheumatism, there has been a second randomized control trial from Italy showing quite consistent results. So really that is based on two, not large size, but two randomized control trials. That's why the recommendation of level one. Next. Now, it, it would be important still to keep in mind that even though you treat with DAA, well, you, you will cure the infection. But in a few cases, it has been reported, I've put in here a reference, there are several in the, in the full text, the immune system may not recover from the, from the uh, polyclonal stimulation before months or even years, or even maybe in a few cases, never. Here is a, a reference from 2018 showing years after the cure of hep C with various regimens, I will not detail, huh? So Fosbivir or even peg interferon in the early days, those four cases again from Italy, from a group that has published quite a bit about that. 
but some relapses, typical relapses with neuropathy, purpura, altralgia, skin ulcer, uh, have been published years. And these have been associated with infection or cancer. And the recent onset of that infection or cancer may be a trigger for the reactivation of the polyclonal activation. So please beware, keep in mind that in those who are cured from the hep C, they may still deserve a follow-up for the cryoglobulinemia, not frequently, but you should keep in mind there may be a relapse. Next slide, please. And so the conclusion overall uh, uh, is that this update concentrated on three chapters, two and four as shown by Paul Martin and the chapter five on GN by myself. The content of the chapters one on the diagnosis and three prevention of hep C in hemodialysis is still considered as valid. And the three main changes as compared with the 2018 guideline is the high effectiveness and tolerance of DH regimens is confirmed. That is not new, but is now extent to the sofosbv based regimens, even in CKD G4, G5. Second, the transplantation of C infected kidneys can be considered irrespectively of the status of the recipient, even, of course, if there are no national or local law or regulation prohibiting that. There have been uh, hundreds of cases reviewed by the work group in the systematic review. And patients with typical mild to moderate hep C related GN can probably be treated first with DAL alone. And the evolution is favorable. A kidney biopsy may not be mandatory in such cases. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I, I'm no doubt we will be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michel. <clears throat> So there are a few questions uh, already. I think I'll start with a few questions for uh, uh, Paul. So there's a question here about uh, HCV positive living donor treated with DAA. And how long do you have to wait until this person can be considered for donation? Okay, so that's a, a very important issue. So in essence, um, you need to be sure that the patient has had a sustained virological response. And we traditionally waited 12 weeks to determine that. Uh, the more recent data suggests you can make that determination at four weeks. So I, I would say a minimum of four weeks following completion of the um, antiviral uh, uh, therapy. As regards the recipients, um, what I would suggest is that a hepatitis C um, PCR or NAT test be done uh, perhaps three months after the uh, uh, transplant to confirm the absence of hepatitis C. Yes, thank you. And there's another question uh, on uh, the hepatitis C positive uh, potential recipient with the elevated uh, liver enzyme transaminitis. Uh, what would be the indication to treat with DAA, or can you uh, go on with the, the transplant irrespective of this? I, I think it would be important to exclude other explanations for the elevated transaminases. And typically, um, patients with a, a severe chronic kidney disease have um, often spuriously uh, low uh, liver enzymes, AST and ALT, particularly the dialysis population. So I think the patient requires an evaluation for liver disease. I would suggest a, an ultrasound and some additional blood work, excluding iron overload, hepatitis B, and a few other um, uh, possibilities. Um, as regards the second part of the question, whether this is acute hepatitis uh, C, uh, the onset of hepatitis C or acute hepatitis C may be difficult to determine, uh, but if the patient had had a recent exposure or you're concerned the patient was uh, uh, within a dialysis uh, uh, unit, again, I would want some clarity about whether this was an acute or chronic hepatitis C infection. There is some concern about performing surgery and giving anesthesia in a patient with markedly elevated uh, liver enzymes. So I, I, I would make sure that you, you, you had a clear timeline of uh, when the patient got hepatitis C to exclude recent acute hepatitis C. Yeah, 
Uh, so uh, in the old days, they used to talk about uh, you could get, uh, you were infected with one virus and then you could get a super infection with another virus, but I don't know how, how uh, pertinent this is in anymore. This was something that was discussed, but uh, anyway, so uh, just, uh, and this is maybe a question to both of you. Do you need to treat uh, all patients with CKD? Uh, for hepatitis C, are there any boundaries? Well, you're uh, speaking <laughs> as a hepatologist. Uh, <laughs> what, what the hepatitis C guidelines suggest from the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease is that every patient is a candidate for hepatitis C treatment unless their life expectancy is less than one year. So that if a patient has multiple comorbidities, you may elect not to treat hepatitis C. But in the population we're talking about today with chronic kidney disease, every patient is a candidate for uh, therapy. Uh, Do you agree, I, Michel? Yeah, yeah well, I, I could not agree more. I would even say that, as we all know as doctors for some uh, decades, at least those <laughs> uh, the experts of this, uh, of this webinar, we never know how long, I mean, a prognosis is always some uncertainty. So I've treated here in Brussels, uh, a, uh, a patient originating from Africa. He must be now 89. He was treated three or four years ago. He's still alive. Now you might have thought uh, because of his age uh, that he would die before that time. I do not regret having treated him. He's on dialysis because of an FC definite related GN that he was scored for 20 years and will never recover from that. In addition, a second reason that should not be the primary reason to treat, but there are now more and more data, even though relatively little, but intellectually it's not hard to understand that in hemodialysis patients, if you treat them, you will also to some extent reduce the risk of transmission within the hemodialysis unit. There has been a, a nice paper from uh, Taiwan uh, a, a year ago or two years ago, uh, convincingly demonstrated that in my opinion, we need more data in that respect, but so there are. The, the first reason to treat should be the, the benefit for the individual patient. But in addition to that, we have been uh, trying to prevent hep C. Hygienic precautions remain important but treatment may indirectly help as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I think we'll move on to another question about, uh, again, the uh, RPGN or, uh, so when would you consider plasmapheresis on top of steroid with tuximab and DAA? Yeah, well, I may start on that one. I would say the following. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the algorithm says DAA, well, virtually everybody, number one. That is the first line, uh, the first pillar, like would say the cardiologists nowadays. Then uh, if they have acute or hyperacute or immune and, and the, the biopsy shows active disease or they have all the clinical signs of active disease like purpura, neuropathy, active and so on, well, they need something else. The wonder drug is rituximab. But definitely, if they have crescents on the biopsy or RPGN clinically, and you don't have a biopsy because there is anticoagulation or whatever, I would not hesitate adding steroids. Short course, some weeks, a month, uh, two months, something like that, and uh, uh, boluses initially, but not high dosage for a long period because that would increase substantially the risk of infection. And then plasma ferries, in my opinion, is in... Uh, uh, a minority of cases. It may help as a bridge to, to get the impact of uh, both rituximab uh, and uh, steroids on the disease, but that would really uh, be a minority. Another practical point I would say is that if you perform plasmapheresis, please do not give rituximab the day before the plasmapheresis or, or a few hours before, because otherwise, the rituximab will be lost by the plasmapheresis and it will be completely useless. So that's a practical aspect that is relevant. I don't know whether Paul wants to add something that would be my, generally speaking. My... No, no, I, I, I agree with your approach. 
Yes, I, I just wanted to comment something about the reactivation, so to speak, or is a immunological reactivation after transplantation. I've also experienced that in liver transplant patients that they all of a sudden get this <laughs> RPGN. Uh, they were treated a long time ago, but after the liver, things can happen with the mm -hmm. immune system uh, that can still oh, look like hepatitis, even though there's no virus. Just one more comment that because you are speaking about reactivation, one other comment that is fully relevant, I think nephrologists in the audience will know that, but if you give rituximab, you should also make sure that they have, whether the, the, the hep B status, right? because there may be also reactivation uh, of hep B, not just because you treat hep C, but because you give rituximab. So that's yeah. another important practical aspect. Yes, very important. Thank you. Uh, so uh, there's one question about acute hepatitis C infection in CKD, uh, the, uh, the use of DAA in that situation. What would be your recommendation? Okay, so again, it may be possible, for instance, in a dialysis patient who has good follow-up to determine the onset uh, of infection. And uh, generally in the non a renal population, we like to wait for several weeks to see whether acute hepatitis C resolves spontaneously or not. In, in the uh, chronic kidney disease population, I think there may be a role for intervening with antiviral therapy sooner rather than later because they're relatively immune uh, uh, compromised. And then secondly, as Michelle mentioned, there's also uh, an aspect of a patient being in a dialysis unit, they, they're infected with hepatitis C, and so they can potentially transmit it within the unit. So I think if if patient does have acute hepatitis C and is, for instance, a dialysis patient, I, I, I would probably treat them uh, sooner rather than uh, later for the reasons I just outlined. Yeah. All right. Uh so uh, let's see, we have some questions here about, well, of course, this issue of the cost of uh, this treatment. Uh, and there is a question about uh, if there is any hope for a single drug therapy for HIV eradication in the future, or are the drugs we have now as well, you know, I, I think perfect. <laughs> well, I, I think we're talking about uh, response rates and uh, nearing 100% the drugs are well tolerated. To prevent resistance, it needs to be a multi-drug uh, regimen. And I, I think from a purely practical point of view that the pipeline now is probably empty because uh, th there's very little need for additional therapy. So the pharmaceutical industry isn't gonna invest a whole lot of resources in any uh, a single drug uh, regimen. Yeah, right. So here is the question about when do we start the DA after transplantation, the optimal time in the postoperative well, period? Sure. I, ideally, it should be started as soon as uh, possible. The concern is if the patient acquires hepatitis C as a result of getting a, a kidney from a, an infected uh, donor, they will may develop acute hepatitis C, and that in turn may affect their, obviously their liver function, but also the, the um, kidney transplant uh, function. And so I, I, I think as soon as is feasible to start the antiviral therapy after kidney transplant. Thank you. Uh, so uh, even though the guide, guideline uh, hasn't changed much regarding uh, the detection evaluation aids, CV and CKD, are there any uh, comments you want to make, Michelle, about this? Uh, you mean uh, chapter three about the prevention? Yeah, prevention and uh, yeah. Yeah, well, chapter three, I would say the following. It remains a topic of, of concern in, in a number of regions in the world. I'm well aware of that. I'm coming back from Asia some days ago. I had discussions with colleagues. So uh, I've been trying to help colleagues around the world in that respect for three decades. Uh, the, from, the, from the discovery of the hep C virus or close after that, and I would be happy to help. So if people want to, if they still have problems, I think the key messages of the guideline 
are still considered valid. They are reproduced in the, in the PDF of the full guideline and of the executive summary. But if colleagues have questions or do need help, I would be to answer probably by email, individual cases or situations. I would even say as a KDGO co-chair that KDGO has been thinking for a long time of confirming that the guidelines, I believe that, but of course I have a conflict of interest, I could be KDGO co-chair, but I believe the guidelines are important and helpful. But uh, confirming or demonstrating that scientifically, well, the prevention of hep C inside hemodialysis unit may be a good topic. So we could think about a, a cluster a trial that would help all units in a country to, to, to reduce their hep C or even uh, eliminate. Even if DAAs are not yet available, I would be happy to help about that. Please do not hesitate to contact me along the KDGO website or my, my email is on PubMed, of course. Uh, I would be happy to help. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we are uh, almost running out of questions. Uh, there's a question here about the patient treatment of hepatitis C in a renal allograft recipient with pulmonary TB. What would you do? <laughs> well, let's say that's complicated. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So <laughs> I think there are a number of priorities there. Uh, the patient's immune compromised. So you want to be uh, intervene quickly for the with the anti tuberculosis. Uh, treatment. Um, so that needs to be started right away. Secondly, as regards the use of the DAAs, I don't believe there's any contraindication, but I would again emphasize the potential for drug to drug interactions. And I would access the University of Liverpool website to uh, review the various uh, regimens and their interactions with anti TB drugs uh, before starting treatment. I see that yes. there's also a question that went by there about differentiating hepatitis C flare uh, or CMV infection. Oh, okay, yeah. I presume this is a real transplant recipient. So um, if the patient is hepatitis C, they're going to be hepatitis C PCR uh, positive. In an organ transplant recipient, um, it's important to differentiate between CMV viremia and CMV infection. So in other words, a patient may have a low level of uh, CMV detected, but it doesn't translate into clinical uh, disease. So that's one important issue. The second issue is to scrutinize the patient, the recipient CMV results pre-transplant and also the information about the uh, donor. The highest risk circumstance in an organ transplant recipient for CMV is if they're CMV naive pre-transplant and they get an organ from a CMV infected uh, donor. So I, I think, and then finally, obviously there's PCR testing available for uh, CMV. So it, there are a few things that need to be uh, looked at to determine a patient has true CMV infection. Yes, that's a very important point. Uh, so uh, I have a question also about uh, er eradication of hepatitis C. There is a goal, uh, the WHO uh, has this uh, long-term goal that we should er eradicate uh, hepatitis C. And what do you think, how realistic is this? And uh, um, when well, will this happen? I. Uh... Well, I'm an optimist by nature. I, I think the problem is there are disadvantaged populations who have difficulty accessing uh, uh, therapy. And I, I think, and if we look, uh, United States is an example of what's happened to the uh, donor pool as, as um, a result of uh, uh, drug usage. You know, unfortunately, I, I think it, the, the goal is aspirational but in terms of a practical reality, I, I think it's going to continue to be uh, very difficult. I'm not sure whether you agree, Michelle, or not. Well, no, I largely agree with what you said. That being said, I think some even lower income countries or middle income like Egypt 
where everybody knows they have the highest prevalence in the world, have at least succeeded in recent years, that has even a massive effort, have succeeded in reducing, not yet eliminating, but reducing that, that prevalence substantially. But that requires, of course, uh, leadership, including uh, policies. And, and, and you spoke about uh, less favorable groups or people with low socioeconomic status. So yeah, that's the, there are difficult population. That's, that's right. I think our kidney population, at least Dallas's kidney transplant recipients, they are usually under specialized care. And that's, I would say, within hand. That's easy to say, but that should be feasible whether in people who, with uh, IV drug use, uh, it's always easy, certainly not, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so- It should, uh, remain, it should remain a goal. Yeah, so uh, I was thinking about the, uh, I mean, I live in Sweden and we have uh, this thing about hepatitis C positive organs. It's quite an unusual uh, finding. I mean, maybe once a year or something. So we don't have the situation as in the US and yeah. it looks, it's different in different countries. There's one more question here is about, is there an increased risk of decompensation uh, uh, of compensate cirrhosis due to hepatitis C after transplantation? I guess that's for Paul. Yeah, so um, if, I think there is an increased risk if the hepatitis C remains untreated. Secondly, if there are other cofactors in the liver disease, such as alcohol use or, or fatty liver in the patient with a metabolic uh, uh, syndrome. So, but I think with the appropriate workup pre-transplant, we can identify patients who, who are likely to develop decompensated cirrhosis after an isolated kidney transplant. Yes, uh, so this is all uh, very important information. So this guideline is, uh, uh, if you have any final questions, uh, we have three minutes left or any comments from the speakers. There's a question here, can a patient on DAA undergo a transplant while on uh, uh, drugs? Mm. So I, I would favor completing the treatment, confirming the patient as a sustained biological response. So we're talking about a delay of four months. My concern about using the drugs um, going into the transplant is patients are then starting immunosuppressive uh, medications. It may be difficult to manage their levels. The, with some of the DAAs, uh, for instance, cyclosporin can increase the, the uh, drug levels of the antiviral agent. So I think it's better to either treat be, and cure before transplant or wait until after transplant and then treat and cure. Thank you. So we are nearing the top of the hour and uh, I would like to thank the speakers for excellent presentations and a very good discussion. And I recommend that you read the uh, guidelines which is freely available on both Kidney International and KDGO. And if you have any questions regarding prevention, uh, please contact Michelle Chadur. So thank you very much. Thank you, Annette. And good thank evening you. for yeah. the ones, or good morning, or whatever, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs>